Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Having trained more than 24,000 vets. Helping you and your fur babies thrive. Live in studio, it's Pet Talk Today with Will Bangura. Answering your pet behavior and training questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Happy Saturday morning, everybody. I'm Will Bangura, your host of Pet Talk Today on 1100 KFNX, where I take your calls and answer your pet behavior and training questions each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. Perhaps you've got a crazy cat or you've got a dog that's completely out of control and you desperately need some training and behavior help. If you're fed up with your pet not listening, well, that's what this show is about. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you deal with all of your pet behavior problems. So give me a call. Learn how to correct those unwanted behaviors. Pick up your phone. Call me if you're in the Phoenix or surrounding area. The number to call is 602 277 Five three six nine six zero two two seven seven KFNX. Those outside of Phoenix can call toll free at eight six six five three six eleven hundred. Well, we've got a great show planned for today. We are going to be interviewing Michael Ellis, world renowned dog trainer Michael Ellis. Uh, Michael is known in the dog sports world uh, for his motivational style of training, uh, using food rewards and more motivational methods versus uh, traditional, aversive, or compulsive methods. And Michael is also somebody who's got one of the top schools for dog trainers in the United States. Um, I have uh, seen some of the work that Michael does as far as his work with dogs, um, his work with uh, people that um, are the owners of those dogs, his work with um, other trainers. It's just something that uh, if you'd have to see it. It's, it's just magical. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a couple phone calls real quick. We've got Laura in Buckeye on the line. Good morning, Laura. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fantastic. How's your Saturday going? You know, so far it's going pretty good. So far? Okay, well, yeah. what can I do for you? What's your question? Okay, so I have seven dogs. They're all little. Um, basically, the whole pack is Chiwinis. I have an Italian Greyhound, a Papillon, and the rest are the Chiwinis. Um, I have about a year and a half ago, I lost uh, the pack leader. Mm-hmm. Um, she And when she passed away, the pack kind of didn't know what to do. Sure. And they, I have two of, two of my dogs are siblings from the same um, litter. Mm-hmm. And the sisters, one um, evening, just got into a horrible fight. And they were drawing blood off of each other. Well, needless to say, in past times when this would happen, the pack leader would come in, stop the fight, Mm -hmm. and she would, you know, she would mend fences. Mm -hmm. Well, there was no one there to mend the fences. And I did my best to try to, you know, get hurt feelings over with, but they just won't forgive each other. Yeah. So I've had to divide my house up. Mm-hmm. One lives on the west side of the house. The other one lives on the east side of the house. And so, which makes it very troublesome because I've got to be very particular on where these dogs are. Right. Because if they do get a hold of each other, they start all over again. And it's a bloodbath. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, I never thought little chihuahuas would be so vicious, mm-hmm. but they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Any dog. And, any dog. Yeah. So what's your question for me, Laura? Yeah. So my question is, how can I reunite them? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
as far as what would be the best when, when it comes to reuniting dogs that are fighting, you know, one of the things that we have to understand is that um, we can't just j- put them right back together. We may put them right back together and they're fine for a day, for two days, for five days a week, two weeks, a month. Then all of a sudden there's a fight. We have to understand that if they're ha- if they have been fighting and if they had a fight, that chances are it's going to happen again. We've got to start a training program with both dogs so that they will listen to us and our commands, not just when things are calm and quiet, but when things are absolutely crazy, when all heck is breaking loose. Because when these dogs are going after one another, all right, they're in that red zone. The adrenaline's just pumping. And they don't have the ability to think. They don't have the ability to use that frontal cortex, that thinking part of the brain, the cognitive part of the brain. They're in that older middle part of the brain, the hippocampus. They are working off of instinct. They're in fight or flight. Okay. So if you want to control your dogs verbally with commands, first and foremost, knowing that they fight and knowing that something like that could happen, you've got to have such great conditioning and repetition that their response to your commands are conditioned to the point of muscle memory where they don't have to think about responding. And you have to train in situations where there's a lot of stimulation and distractions and things going on to try to teach them to keep focus no matter what else is going on around them. Because one of the most difficult things is going to be when uh, they get back together. Now, again, don't get the false illusion and the false hope because you get them together that everything's okay. So one of the things we do is we begin to bring the dogs out at a distance. If necessary, if we need to muzzle the dogs, we muzzle the dogs. You know, most of the time, at some point in the training, the dogs are going to get muzzled as they get close enough so they can't hurt each other. Um, we are reading body language. We, our clients learn an extensive amount of body language uh, information and education about canine body language, the stress signals, the calming signals, because we have to be able to read that body language because I don't care what distance it is. If your dogs are showing stress signals, um, it's going to get worse the closer we get. And stress and anxiety are at the root. Fear is at the root of all aggression. So first thing is you've got to be able to have control of your dog. That's phenomenal obedience uh control. Secondly, you have to then work on gradually and systematically getting your dogs together closer and closer over a period of time. That can take months before they're actually nose to nose. And there's a big process to that. I always tell people, look, if you've got aggression, that can be serious. If you've got aggression, that's something that's really difficult to try to do on your own, whether it be reading a book, whether it be going on YouTube, whether it be buying some DVDs, if anybody watches DVDs anymore, um, whether or not, you know, it's calling the show. Um, the best way I can help you right now is to tell you that, hey, keep them separated because you have to. If you have another fight, it's only going to get worse. Right. The other thing and is it's, hire a trainer. It's been, hire a okay. trainer to help you. Hire someone who's very skilled uh, in working with uh, dogs with aggression because – this is not an easy thing. And I wish when people called with aggression that, um, you know, I had some great answers. But quite frankly, um, I could do a complete show just on aggression alone. And, and maybe in the future I'll do that. Maybe I'll do a show or two or a series just on aggression because there is so much that needs to be covered. And I'm not doing any justice um, when we're just, you know, taking a call or two on that. Anyway, I'm Will Bangura, and you are listening to Pet Talk today on 1100 KFNX where I take your calls and answer your pet behavior and training questions each and every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. And we are going to go to break here. And when we come back, hopefully, we are going to be talking to Michael Ellis. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I can't. 
can't control my emotions. Control my emotions. I can't get these thoughts out of my head. Thoughts out of my head. Thoughts out of my head. I sleep all day. I sleep all day. Or I can't sleep at all. I can't sleep at all. If I can't concentrate, I'm going to fail again. I'm going to fail again. Fail again. Why would anyone want to be with me? Anyone want to be with me? My heart is beating out of my chest. Beating out of my chest. Beating out of my chest. I just can't live like this anymore. Like this anymore. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. It takes courage to reach out for help. At Mesa Psychiatry, we'll help you find the peace and calmness that's been missing for so long. Depression, fear, and anxiety don't have to define you. Together at Mesa Psychiatry, we'll begin the process of restoring your confidence and emotional well-being, bringing joy and happiness back into your life. Begin the journey of healing today by calling Mesa Psychiatry at 480-882-1014. That's 480-882-1014. Or schedule an appointment online at mesapsychiatry.com. dog that needs obedience training? Is your dog's bad behavior driving you crazy? You love your dog and choosing the right dog trainer is important. Hiring a dog trainer that you can trust may be what's most important. Phoenix Dog Training is the most trusted dog training company in Arizona. Phoenix Dog Training is accredited with the Better Business Bureau and has an A-plus rating that you can trust. Having an untrained and unruly dog can be frustrating, embarrassing, and even costly. All that can change with one phone call to Phoenix Dog Training. For over 30 years, Phoenix Dog Training has been the Valley's number one choice for thousands of happy dog owners. Phoenix Dog Training is the winner of the Phoenix Award for Best Dog Behavior Training and impressive seven years in a row. Say goodbye to your dog's bad behavior and hello to the dog of your dreams. Call Phoenix Dog Training today at 602-769-1411. That's 602-769-1411. Or visit them on the web at phoenixdogtraining.com. Are you planning a trip or just going away for a day or two? I want to take a minute to talk about the folks at Paw Nanny Tammy. It's difficult to leave a pet behind. It's even more difficult for your pet. Forget sending your pet to a stressful boarding and kennel facility and instead give your pet and furry best friend the gift of relaxation. Staying at home with one of the professional in-home pet sitters at Paw Nanny Tammy. Your pet will love chilling out with Tammy or one of her team members who will be playing with and taking care of your pet 24 hours a day where it's most comfortable, your pet's home. The other awesome thing is that they can bring in mail, water plants, trees, and even your lawn. Call Pawn Annie Tammy to inquire about having them stay with your pet while you're away. They even offer a free meet and greet to make sure that it's the perfect fit. Call 602-472-4360. That's 602-472-4360. Or visit their website, pawnannytammy.com. Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Sharing funny tales about your four-legged fur babies. Answering questions, some even ridiculous. And taking your calls, it's Pet Talk Today with your host, Will Bangura. To have your questions answered or to comment on today's show, call the KFNX listener line at 602-277-5369. 602-277-KFNX. Those outside of Phoenix call toll-free 866-536-1100. Now, back to Pet Talk Today with your host and everyone's favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Welcome back. I'm Will Bangura, and you're listening to Pet Talk Today on 1100 KFNX. Pet Talk Today is here every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. where I answer your pet behavior and training questions. Um, if you have a question and uh, we're not able to answer your question, you can always email a question to us. The email address is info at pettalktoday.com. Uh, Before we went to break, I was talking to um, Laura. We were talking about dog aggression, and I mentioned to her that there's so much about dog aggression that I will probably be doing a series, which will take several weeks, where we'll devote the entire show just to um, aggression, different types of aggression, how to manage it, uh, what it is that you need to do to try to uh, live safely 
you know, with dogs that are aggressive. But right now we are going to go to our next segment and we, I'm just, I'm honored. I'm honored because um, I'm going to get a chance and you're going to get a chance to listen to Michael Ellis. Uh, Michael Ellis is an internationally renowned dog trainer and teacher with 30 years of experience in the competitive dog sports area. And He's taught extensively to a very diverse group of trainers from competitive sport trainers, uh, police departments, uh, to the U.S. military, to search and rescue groups. He's done service dog training. Uh, he's worked with uh, different uh, pet dog trainers on, on pet dog training. Uh, it's been said that Michael's clear, concise, and patient style has made him one of the most popular coaches of trainers in the country. Uh, he's given over 300 seminars in the United States, Canada, and South America, uh, which is well over a 1,000 days of lecture and practical work. Uh, and he's done that in the last eight years alone. And as a result, he has been one of the driving forces in popularizing reward-based training systems for the protection sports area. Uh, Michael has competed in and done decoy helper work for several national level competitions, both in Schutzen and ring sport. He was also one of the first Mondo ring decoys certified in the United States. He has coached uh, national champions in several disciplines and many national and international competitors, but it's been said he is perhaps most proud of the hundreds of club level and beginning trainers that he has helped to improve their communication and physical skills. Uh, he was a past president of the American Working Malinois Association and a former board member of the U.S. Mondo Ring Association. And that is one heck of a bio. Michael Ellis, welcome to Pet Talk today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Will. Really appreciate you guys having me on. You know, um, I first heard of you. I first learned of you. Um, I think when I was on uh, Learberg.com, this is quite quite a ways back, um, and I started seeing clips that uh, Ed w was showing, and the thing that impressed me the most was uh, the unique uh, blend that uh, made just perfect sense to me. It really matched with the way that uh, I like to train um, you know, positive base, but I'm okay with using aversives, you know, after they've learned and, and then using aversives in a very special way that isn't, you know, anything that causes fear or pain or intimidation. So, um, really resonated with what you were doing and, um, wanted to get you on the show, uh, so that we can go ahead and promote you, promote uh, you've got a school for dog trainers as well, and just kind of chit chat about dogs sure. and uh, and dog training. Um, how did you first get involved with with dogs in any way, and, or dog training? <laughs> I think uh, my story is not unlike uh, lots of lots of dog trainers. I was a animal junkie from the time I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, bothering the parents for a uh, for a dog, and that where they finally caved when I was in junior high school. 12 or 13, mm -hmm. got a German Shepherd, and uh, well, the parents said I had to train it, so went to the local German Shepherd dog club and mm -hmm. took an obedience class, got involved in confirmation, and um, it was just sort of appealed to me right away. Um, I have a little bit of a different arc, I think, than a lot of uh, professional trainers in that I sort of didn't set out to have this be my career. Mm -hmm. It was a hobby all through high school and college. Um, something that I did uh, for fun and got involved in sport and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there was a period when uh, I had left a certain club that I'd been training with and they had some new members and they asked if I'd come back and help out with the new members. And so I did a little bit and so I gave a little mini clinic and um, and that spawned another one and another one. And next thing you know, I was flying around the country uh, to dog training clubs mostly helping people that were already dog trainers uh, get better at that. Um, and uh, 
I woke up one day and said, oh, I guess this is, this isn't the arc of my career now at this ah. point. And, uh, um, I found that, uh, my interest in, uh, dogs shift. I mean, obviously anybody that's good at dog training is really interested in dogs and understanding it, but the mm-hmm. teaching part of it really appealed to me at a certain point in there. And I found that, um, I could have more impact on the culture of dog training by training other trainers. And so although I've certainly, uh, like any dog trainer that's done this professionally, have helped lots of people train their own dogs individually and, and done pet dog training and certainly all of that, um, the shift into like a trainer of trainers for me mm-hmm, was, mm-hmm. Um, was a way in which I could sort of impact a larger group of people and to kind of try to bring what is, I'm sure you know, good fundamental dog training uh, to as many people as possible because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what good dog training is um, amongst the general public, certainly, and even amongst a lot of dog trainers. Um, and uh, so finding a way to reach as many different trainers who are then are going to go out and reach all their clients uh, seemed to be the best way to do that. So kind of dove in this world. Wow. Absolutely. That's, that's a great story. Um, you know, you mentioned something about misconceptions, um, as far as what is good dog training. Um, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, I think lots of people look at dogs, um, um, as, as something that you, uh, you train and you're done, right? That mm-hmm. you step in and there's a problem, you address that specific problem. And you're done, but it's it's not. It's an ongoing process, and just like all the things that we learn in life, um, it you're never finished with it. If you've learned something and you stop attending to it, stop practicing it, stop thinking about it, uh, that skill erodes. And um, I think getting people to understand that dog training is a day to day activity. That if you're going to have it's relationship based. It's consistency based. It's kind of showing up and putting in the time and doing the work. Uh, it's being thoughtful about setting things up. It's not, there are not a lot of quick fixes. I think our society is focused on like, I have this problem. Who can help me fix this problem quickly? Mm-hmm. Instead of looking at kind of the process and developing a relationship with dogs. And I think lots of people are excited by the glamorous aspects or what they uh, kind of think dog training is. Uh, and the human dog connection is kind of remarkable. There's no other species, certainly, that forms relationships with us the way dogs do. But it's a, it's a process-driven thing. You have to kind of like the day-to-day. You have to like being consistent. You have to like animal husbandry. And um, generally speaking, the drama in dog training comes from people trying to solve problems quickly mm. and people not actually committing to consistent day-to-day interactions with their dog. And so uh, true. Um, there's no magic techniques. Like the, everybody's looking for the new uh, special way of doing it. The information's out there and we're all playing off the same sets of themes. Mm-hmm. And it's really about finding the right set of tools to use on a given dog and then being consistent about it and being and showing up, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my world is um, I've got a dog training business here in Phoenix, and, you know, um, 99% of what we're doing is pet dog training. Uh, mm-hmm. We tend to focus very heavily on um, dogs with aggression issues, dogs with fears and phobias. And, um, boy, when you talk about how it is a process, and it takes time, and there's no quick fixes. That is the truth. And, and the hardest thing is for us a lot of times is to get uh, people to um, uh, have the discipline to continue to train their dogs. Michael, we've got to uh, take a break and go to um, uh, commercial in, in just a little bit. Um, sure. But when we come back, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your school that you have. It's in California, is that correct? Correct, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, when we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit about your school, kind of share the different courses you have. 
Um, and then after that, I think we'll talk a little bit more about, um, you know, dog training. Pet dog training would be something that I'd like to get into. So we will do sure. that when we get back. I'm Will Bangura. You're listening to Pet Talk today on 1100 KFNX. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Visit us online at 1100kfnx.com. Arizona's only independent voice. Independent Talk, 1100 KFNX. CBS News Brief. In Oregon, amid the massive wildfires blazing in the nation's west, officials say they are preparing for a possible mass fatality event. This as many remain missing across the scorched land. This woman is at her wit's end. The fire is... Ah, very scary. Seeing the stuff that's been going on and all of it burning down. There's a different kind of weather warning for the Gulf Coast again. CBS News meteorologist David Parkinson says there's a new tropical storm. The entire southwest coast could be seeing some really heavy rain, three, four, five inches of rain in a short period of time. As a result, can't rule out the flash flooding threat. But there's good news for football fans. <laughs> A new version of Little Richard's 1956 hit, Rip It Up, is going to be ESPN's new theme song for Monday Night Football as the network tries to bring some new energy to fans amid the COVID-19 pandemic. CBS News Brief. I'm Allison Keyes. Arizona News Radio State Health Officials report 605 new coronavirus cases today and 27 new deaths. We now have more than 208,000 cases and more than 5,300 fatalities. Our positive rate is at 4%. Been that way for four weeks. While the Navajo Nation has made significant progress in its fight against COVID-19, President Jonathan Nez says the pandemic is far from over. I could say that we've won our first battle. But in a, in a war, there's multiple battles, right? And there may be a second wave. That means there's a second battle. And now we got to prepare ourselves for that second battle. Tucson City Council member Paul Durham will take a temporary leave from the council because his husband is getting treated for terminal cancer. And the U of A has hired private security guards to make sure that students follow COVID-19 protocols. D-backs beat the Mariners 4-3. to three. Mike Salceda, Arizona News Radio. From the KFNX Weather Center. Well, this morning, a clear sky, sunny with widespread haze today, the high 104. Clear and hazy tonight, low 78. Sunshine with a haze on Sunday, high 106. Sunny Monday, high 106. I'm meteorologist Jim Rinaldi from the KFNX Weather Bug Weather Center. Currently in downtown Phoenix, it's 80 degrees. Next news in 30 minutes or when it breaks, here on Independent Talk, 1100 KFNX. Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Sharing funny tales about your four-legged fur babies. Answering questions, some even ridiculous. And taking your calls, it's Pet Talk Today with your host, Will Bangura. To have your questions answered or to comment on today's show, call the KFNX listener line at 602-277-5369. 602-277-KFNX. Those outside of Phoenix call toll-free 866-536-1100. Now, back to Pet Talk Today with your host and everyone's favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Welcome back. I'm Will Bangura. You're listening to Pet Talk Today on 11. 11- 700 KFNX. I'm here each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. where I take your calls and answer your pet behavior and training questions. Uh, today we are interviewing uh, Michael Ellis. I'm honored to have Michael uh, with me. Uh, we were talking a little bit about before we went to break um, some dog training uh philosophy issues, but I want to um, have, Michael, you've got um, a school for dog trainers, and I think that will also uh, let us know a little bit about your approach and, and how you do things. Can you share uh, with us um, about your school for dog trainers? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's 
11 years now, uh, I opened a, a school for trainers. I had been traveling full time, giving seminars to dog training clubs and organizations and, uh, uh, a lot of travel and was a little burnt on the traveling thing. So, uh, I had spent a significant amount of time kind of coaching other trainers. So I thought the best, as I mentioned before, the best thing I could do was to open, uh, a school for trainers to help people become better trainers. And I think like we all are trainers of trainers in a sense. And mm-hmm. that if you're a pet dog trainer, you're helping someone become a trainer. They don't have to become a professional, but they, you know, right. they have to understand good training and good training principles and how learning theory works and all of that. And so I, I, I opened a school, um, uh, and initially, um, I kind of envisioned it as being, um, like dog trainers college, right? People could go and immerse themselves in a kind of long-term program. But having come off uh, a traveling schedule, I knew lots of trainers out there that were um, already had businesses and things like that um, that wanted continuing education, couldn't leave their businesses mm. uh, to go to school for six months or any of that kind of thing. So I broke a lot of the program up into little modules, a week and two week long kind of intensive courses on different subjects. Um, and that was my initial model. And then over the years, we've added an intensive program as well. So we have students that come and stay with us for five months and kind of immerse themselves in dog training completely. And then we also have uh, students and um, trainers that already are established trainers come to take classes on specific topics to continue their education. Anything from, you know, beginning behavior creation, reward-based training, to proper electronic collar work, to how to motivate dogs, good management strategies, all kinds of things like that. Um, and then we have some sports-specific classes, too, for people that are interested in, be it agility or protection sports or dock dive, all kinds of, you know, there's a million things you can do with your dogs, which is lovely. Uh, and we try to kind of uh, educate people on the through line between all these things, how pet dog training and sport dog training and police dog training and service dog training really are all operating on the same set of principles, and we're just making adjustments to the dog and the person in front of us. Talk a little bit more about that. If you were really wanting to uh, kind of explain that to just your everyday pet dog owner, how, how would you explain that to them? How would that make sense to them? I would say, like, understanding how the process works, right? So just understanding how dogs learn, right? Understanding what mm-hmm. we, we call learning theory, classical and operant conditioning, understanding the basic ways in which we manipulate dogs, how we introduce the tools we're going to use, uh, whether we're using rewards or whether we're using the leash. Um, and if you have an understanding of all the tools and principles, uh, then you can sit down and say, what are my goals for this dog? And you can do a sort of temperament assessment. This dog's a more excitable dog. This dog's a more easily motivated dog. This dog's a lower energy dog. And your goals, meaning what kinds of behaviors do I want the dog to perform? And understanding, you don't have to, again, become a professional, but understanding how the process works and understanding how dogs think on a basic level allows you then to make a plan that suits that dog. And so what I would do for a sport dog, I'm using the same sets of tools to manipulate that dog. Mm -hmm. I'm just creating higher levels of motivation, and I wouldn't necessarily need that in a pet dog. But I need some motivation in a pet dog. I need them motivated to come when called and things like that. And so it's just degrees and details, but the principles are all exactly the same. And what I would love is for everyone to kind of, uh, everyone, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, I think it should be in school. I mean, 50% of the households in the country Mm. plus have dogs. You can't go out in the world without encountering a dog. Mm -hmm. And to me, basic kind of understanding of dog behavior uh, should be in in our our uh, our elementary and secondary education in some fashion because people we live with them so intensely and if you understand that then it's just small adjustments on the same sets of principle. Right? You know, and, it, it seems to me. Sorry to interrupt you, but when you no, were saying fine. when you were saying that, Mike, I was thinking to myself the times that I've been visiting Europe. You know, it seems to me that uh, pet dogs in in Europe are very different than pet dogs here in the United States. For sure. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, I think it's that, you know, they, perhaps they take that similar attitude 
Um, you know, with you competing around the world and training uh, other trainers that compete, um, you know, maybe uh, you can talk about that. I don't know if you uh, can or not, but um, I talk to my my clients about the differences in attitude uh, between, you know, Europe and the United States and, and why and how we have certain problems here. Can, can you maybe touch on that? Ab- absolutely. I think, I think you're spot on that uh, dog training is uh, deep in the European culture, especially the Western European culture. Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's trickled down in a way. And for whatever reason, um, most of the Europeans that I know, whether they have a pet dog or not, they appreciate that uh, that dog training is a process and that your dog should be trained, right? Mm-hmm. I encounter more people uh, in the U.S., uh, and I'm not uh, uh, exactly sure why, who think that dogs should just be dogs, right? Mm-hmm. But, of course, uh, we're asking for a species to live in society, and there are rules for living in society that we all have to. Uh, abide by and so that's it's not particularly a functional way of looking at it and they're more practical about it in a sense they're like dogs are going to live amongst us then they need to be trained and it's sort of a given uh that they take that on and also i think uh in the u.s we have a little bit of uh an attention span problem (laughs) we have a instant gratification culture a little bit Mm -hmm. i think Mm -hmm. and so people want to get to the end without doing the work without taking the journey. Um, and I didn't encounter that as much with the Europeans. They understand the puppy's a puppy, uh, my European friends, and they understand that you can't expect a two-year-old to behave uh, like a 10-year-old and like an 18-year-old, like a 20-year-old the same way, right? And they, mm-hmm. they, um, they're in it for the haul. And as a result, uh, the dogs are better behaved. There are dogs in public there all the time. They're well-behaved. They understand it and people are practical about that yeah the other thing that um that i saw and and and, uh, you know like i said you've been there um a whole lot more than i have i last time i was there uh gosh 1989 and i was just a young kid in the army at the time but i remember because i similar to you i had a German Shepherd growing up. I started training dogs at uh, the North Shore German Shepherd Dog Training Cup Club, which was an AKC, uh, mm-hmm. you know, based uh, club. And you know, of course, we trained and 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 we competed with our dogs, you know, and, and did the whole AKC uh, obedience stuff with the dog. But what impressed me was that when I was in Europe um, in the army, um, you know, people could take their dogs anywhere, and yeah. Their dogs, when they were walking them, were aloof. Mm-hmm. They could care less about me. Yep. They could care less about another person who's walking by with their dog. Mm-hmm. So different than what we have here where most of the time when a dog sees a person on a walk or whatever, they're going crazy. They're excited. They're out of control. Same thing when people come over to the house, guests come over, the dog's crazy, it's out of control. And then also with other dogs, yeah. meeting other dogs, they're out of control. And a lot of times that is, you know, uh, one of the things that a trigger, you know, to some of the aggression that dogs have. And um, it's such a different uh, way of uh Thinking about how we interact with our dogs in our culture, in our society. And, you know, I wish people would uh, see this more. I'm glad we're talking about it because you get to enjoy your dog a whole lot more when it has that high level of training. Oh, it's incredible. It's completely different. And it, I think you've hit on something in there when you're talking about the Europeans. Their dogs aren't what I would call neutral, mm-hmm. right? They're uninterested, but they also, that's cultivated through socialization, and meaning we have here in the U.S. sort of a, a dog park culture yes. where everybody goes out and wants their dogs to meet other dogs, yeah. and in public, people want to pet your dog. In Europe, nobody considers petting your dog. Yep. Like, they wouldn't even consider asking. It's just not on their radar. It's, it's not their dog. They wouldn't pet it, but here, people, you have to fend people off if you're not careful. Well, they're offended so, if you won't let them. Yeah, and absolutely, we're, you're putting dogs in a lot of situations. They're taking dogs out there 
cutting them loose with other dogs. They're making them very doggy. They're not cultivating that kind of sense of neutrality and control before the freedom, right? The freedom is given from the beginning. And then you got to try to rein it in after the dogs had a life of freedom. And that's much more challenging than had you sort of set boundaries and not let it get to that point to begin with. And it's, it is a cultural difference. People here, when you try to counsel them not to let their dog go meet every dog they see on the street or let everyone pet their dog, they um, feel like they're depriving their dog in some way of, of something, which is uh, they're setting themselves up for difficulties, unfortunately. Well, I, you know, I always tell them, I joke with them, I say, listen, the first day your dog comes up to you and tells you, whispers in your ear or yells at you and says, hey, I want to go to the dog park. Well, then go ahead and take your dog to the dog park. We've got to take another <laughs> break uh, to hear from our sponsors. Uh, Michael, please hold on. Uh, when we get back from the break, we'll continue our conversation with Michael Ellis. We'll be right back. Are you planning a trip or just going away for a day or two? I want to take a minute to talk about the folks at Paw Nanny Tammy. It's difficult to leave a pet behind. It's even more difficult for your pet. Forget sending your pet to a stressful boarding and kennel facility and instead give your pet and furry best friend the gift of relaxation. Staying at home with one of the professional in-home pet sitters at Paw Nanny Tim. Your pet will love chilling out with Tammy or one of her team members who will be playing with and taking care of your pet 24 hours a day where it's most comfortable, your pet's home. The other awesome thing is that they can bring in mail, water plants, trees, and even your lawn. Call Paw Nanny Tammy to inquire about having them stay with your pet while you're away. They even offer a free meet and greet to make sure that it's the perfect fit. Call 602-472-4360. That's 602-472-4360. Or visit their website, pawnannytammy.com. I can't control my emotions. Control my emotions. I can't get these thoughts out of my head. Thoughts out of my head. Thoughts out of my head. I sleep all day. I sleep all day. Or I can't sleep at all. I can't sleep at all. If I can't concentrate, I'm going to fail again. I'm going to fail again. Fail again. Why would anyone want to be with me? Want to be with me? My heart is beating out of my chest. Beating out of my chest. Beating out of my chest. I just can't live like this anymore. Like this anymore. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. It takes courage to reach out for help. At Mesa Psychiatry, we'll help you find the peace and calmness that's been missing for so long. Depression, fear, and anxiety don't have to define you. Together at Mesa Psychiatry, we'll begin the process of restoring your confidence and emotional well-being, bringing joy and happiness back into your life. Begin the journey of healing today by calling Mesa Psychiatry at 480-882-1014. That's 480-882-1014. Or schedule an appointment online at mesapsychiatry.com. Dog that needs obedience training? Is your dog's bad behavior driving you crazy? You love your dog and choosing the right dog trainer is important. Hiring a dog trainer that you can trust may be what's most important. Phoenix Dog Training is the most trusted dog training company in Arizona. Phoenix Dog Training is accredited with the Better Business Bureau and has an A-plus rating that you can trust. Having an untrained and unruly dog can be frustrating, embarrassing, and even costly. All that can change with one phone call to Phoenix Dog Training. For over 30 years, Phoenix Dog Training has been the Valley's number one choice for thousands of happy dog owners. Phoenix Dog Training is the winner of the Phoenix Award for Best Dog Behavior Training and Impressive seven years in a row. Say goodbye to your dog's bad behavior and hello to the dog of your dreams. Call Phoenix Dog Training today at 602-769-1411. That's 602-769-1411. Or visit them on the web at phoenixdogtraining.com. Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Sharing funny tales about your four-legged fur babies. Answering questions, some even ridiculous. And taking your calls, it's Pet Talk Today with your host, Will Bangura. To have your questions answered or to comment on today's show, call the KFNX listener line at 602-277-5369. 602-277-KFNX. Those outside of Phoenix call toll-free 866-536-1100. Now, back to Pet Talk Today with your host and everyone's favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Pet Talk today on 1100 KFNX. I'm Will Bangura, your host. 
where I take your calls and answer your pet behavior and training questions each and every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. If you ever miss an episode of Pet Talk Today, be sure and check out our podcast. You can go to Apple Podcast or you can go to Spotify. Just do a search for Pet Talk Today and be sure to subscribe to that. You can also communicate with us, see what's happening with Pet Talk Today by going to our Facebook page. Go to Facebook and just do a search for Pet Talk Today as well. Uh, before we went to break, we were talking to world-renowned trainer and trainer of trainers, Michael Ellis. Michael, welcome back. Thanks. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, I went on your website and I was looking through some of the information on your courses and I thought it was interesting and, and just thought uh, having you expound on it would be great. Um, in your behavior modification course, mm-hmm. um, you talk about in the beginning the course will focus on holistic approaches. And then at the bottom it says students will learn to approach behavior modification globally instead of the all-too-common tact for isolating the problem behavior. Can you expand on that a little bit and talk about that? Because I think that that's something not only trainers uh, need to learn and and we need more of, but, you know, obviously them training pet dog owners, uh, those that are in that part of the industry. Um, But can you talk more about that? Absolutely. Like, I think it, it's, I mean, if you could get one thing through to the general public about behavioral issues, mm-hmm. that one is that I've mentioned, there are very, very few quick fixes right. um, for true behavior problems, established behavior problems. And frequently tackling the problem head on creates conflict and stress and can actually exacerbate the problem. And it's looking at the, your entire relationship, the structure in the dog's life, um, managing their environment, installing alternative behaviors through training, mm-hmm. um, making sure you're satisfying the dog's needs. So there's an entire way of kind of altering your relationship. And every behavior problem has a kind of multi-pronged approach. You need to kind of identify the problem and the trigger so that you can control uh, when the dog's being accessing uh, what's triggering the behavior in the dog. And then you need to manage that so the dog doesn't continue to rehearse the behavior you want while you address other things. Can I communicate with my dog? Does my dog understand uh, the alternative behaviors that are incompatible with the behavior that I want? And so there's a whole series. There's obedience. There's management. There's um exercise, there's all kinds of other pieces in the way that we live with our dogs and approach training. And if you don't take in the whole, uh, the whole dog and the whole situation, then for, you're, you're going to be beating your head against the wall. And quick fixes frequently either make a problem worse or they're temporary, right? And you'll have the same problem back very shortly. And I think people radically underestimate the necessity of managing a dog with that has a behavioral issue. It takes time to address that and preventing the dog from continuing to do it in the short term uh, while you address that is essential and changing your lifestyle sometimes is necessary and that's a hard thing for people to understand. People think that if I'm not tackling the problem head on, I'm not dealing with it, that I'm in some way avoiding it, but it's a necessary piece of the puzzle. Yeah, that is, that is, that is so true. Um, I want to talk just briefly about, um, another thing that was in there and it said how to, um, shorten your training timelines while still being fair to the dog. Absolutely. Yeah. So in, in sport training, so if I'm training my own dog, Mm -hmm. and of course I would love this for everybody, but if I'm training my own personal dog, I don't, I don't have a timeline. Meaning right. I'm going to let the dog dictate it for me, and I'm going to take as much time with each little thing as I think is necessary. And I don't say my dog has to be doing this by six months or this by a year or this by two years. I let that unfold as it feels like it should, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, of course, if you're a professional trainer, somebody is not going to sign on for two years of lessons. <laughs> they they need to see progress in a shorter time frame. Mm-hmm. So what we wind up doing is there are compromises in doing that, right? Everything's not going to be exactly perfect. So helping people understand 
what compromises are acceptable, and then when you're making compromises that put the dog in a position uh, to fail and force us to use tools, aversive tools that we wouldn't have to. And so where's that sweet spot in between where I'm still doing my job of being fair to the dog, teaching them before holding them accountable, all those sorts of things, and um, but also satisfying the client's needs and helping them see progress uh, so that they want to stick with it uh, and they want to keep in it. And so that's the pet dog trainer's dilemma, ultimately, yes. is that idea that, okay, I don't have an infinite amount of time due to economics and what my clients are willing to tolerate, but how can I get the best possible dog training in in a timeline that's still fair to the dog? And um, that compromise is, of course, different depending on the dog the skill of the client and mm-hmm. their goals or needs, mm-hmm. but um, I think generally uh, most of the traditional pet dog uh, programs that are out there are driven more by economics than good dog training, and it's not the fault of the trainers. You're they're out there competing, and if, so people offering, okay, I have a you know three week inboard to off leash mm-hmm. obedience kind of mm-hmm. thing. There's no way you're doing that and being fair to the dog. Right. Like that that's that's not a realistic time frame. You're gonna to have to jump a lot of steps. But there's somewhere between that and okay, a six month in board that mm-hmm. um that can maintain fairness and be uh, effective as well. You know, it's interesting that you say that because in Phoenix, in my market, the board and train is huge. And my guess is it's pretty much that way uh, for pet dog trainers throughout the country, that board and train is huge, huge especially knowing how uh, a lot of pet dog owners would love to. You know, we were talking about quick fixes. They'd love to be able to just send their dog away. Yep. Um, and, and believe that it's going to come back and everything's fixed. And, you know, um, I won't do board and train. Um, it is against my philosophy. I don't think that it's effective. Um, and especially, uh, with the fact that, you know, 90% of what we do is, uh, deal with dogs with, you know, severe aggression issues. Sure. Um, you're not going to do that in, in that time frame. Also, gosh, that needs to be the skills that the owner needs to learn sure. in order yeah. to manage a dog like that. Cause it's management. It's not a cure. And, and, I think you're you're right, and I think uh, the truth is that uh, like if if it's just a board and train, mm-hmm. somebody's expecting you to set, to send the dog to you, and yeah. you train it and give it back to them, and it's done. Then you're absolutely right. But there are hybrid models. Like there's no there is no successful dog training program that doesn't include the client in the process. If they don't understand it, if they're not committed to it, if they're not interested in maintaining it, nothing you do is going to help. And so what I found when I was doing board and train, mm-hmm. uh, the model that I settled on is I could take the dog for short periods of time to because obviously we do it all the time. So right. I could move over some basic skills kind of quickly yeah. compared to a client. And then, but I showed them uh, they were included in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So I might take the dog and do a little bit and then I would meet with them, show them what I did. I would have them do the same thing with the dog. And then I could, then they'd send them home with the dog for a period of time. They'd work. I'd take the dog back progress something, do it again. So they were there every step of the way and involved every step of the way and understood what the process looked like so that away from that, they could continue to maintain it. But then some of the technical things you could speed up a little bit. And I think that's some of the benefit. And then sometimes with behavior problems, getting the dog out of the environment for a short period of time while you to sort of reset them a little bit can mm-hmm. be helpful too, right? Because the problem may be exacerbated by the situation at home. And so sometimes pulling them out of there, there are situations, but the classic model, send my dog, get it trained, yeah. get it back, and I'm done. Mm-hmm. No, that doesn't work. I agree with you 100%. Michael, I hate that we are out of time. I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for being my guest and sharing your knowledge with everybody. Folks, uh, make sure that you tune in next Saturday for Pet Talk Today. From 9 to 10 a.m., I'm Will Bangora, your host. Have a great rest of your weekend. We are out of here. You're listening to Independent.